Welcome back to another episode of My Daily Bread. This is the place where sons and daughters from around the world gather at the table of the Lord and feast on the bread of life. We invite you to grab your Bible, something to write with, and a cup of coffee, and join us and listen for the voice of Jesus to speak to each and every one of us through his word. Let's get going. Father, in the name of Jesus, What an honor and privilege it is to come together with my brothers and sisters from around the world and sit at your table again in the evening. We're so grateful. Father, I pray that in these moments that our ears would be tuned in to the revelation of you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our conversations. We invite you into our homes, into our cars, wherever we're gathering tonight. We invite you into these moments and ask you, Lord, to reveal Jesus to us. Not just for knowledge's sake, but that we would be transformed into the image of the one who suffered be sacrificed and who loves beyond our measure and ability to love. We love you, Jesus. Love you so much. We thank you for being present. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 1. By the way, we'll be reading from the ESV version each night throughout the study. Those of you who are going to be helping to read in the coming days, that's the one thing I do ask that we all be congruent with the the version that we're using for these next 24 days. Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just 
to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, so will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy the son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be a to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went into haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she explained, exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed 
that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. So behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, no. He shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and on all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Father, I love your word. 
Oh, I love your word. Thank you, Jesus. I love this gospel account of Luke, and I can hardly wait for the coming days. But for just a couple of moments, I want to slow down and look at this entire chapter before we start discussing and just share some things that I've been writing in my journal today regarding Luke's gospel account. One of the things that I love about this book is that Luke is a book that was written with a message about everyone for everyone. I want you for these next several days to understand that when Luke is teaching, the, this physician is teaching, think about what it would have been like if you were the one he was writing to. In this gospel account, Luke shows us Jesus as the compassionate son of man. And he's focused on so many things. And to be specific on what he focuses on in the coming chapters is Lucas focuses is on the mighty works of the Lord that we're going to see each and every day. His, his thoughts are focused. His, his words are focused towards the, the Lord's powerful messages and words. And Luke focuses on something that is important for you and I as believers to understand and also focus our thoughts and attention on when we're walking with the Lord. And that's his suffering, his death, and this resurrection. As believers in Jesus, three things that we will never escape coming into this great salvation is the fact that he suffered for us, that he died for us, and he resurrected for us. Thank you, Jesus. In our journey through the gospel account of Luke, the main interest that we look at is salvation history. It shows us what God has done in Christ Jesus to bring salvation to sinners. In fact, the key message that we can find in the gospel account of Luke is found all the way towards the end of the book in chapter 19, where Luke proudly and boldly proclaims that the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you have ever found yourself in those moments where you feel lost, if you have ever found your life in the, the throes of sin and feeling like you don't believe and feeling like you're all by yourself out in the wilderness of brokenness, you can rest assured that our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to seek and to save each and every one of us. In the coming days, fam, we're going to meet individuals. We're going we're gonna to see crowds. We're going to look at women and children as well as the men. We're going to look at the poor. We're going to take a look at the rich. We're going to look at saints and sinners because the truth is... All of them, and all of us, are on his heart. You are on his heart tonight. Wherever you're sitting, wherever you find yourself in life, if you're dealing with addiction, if you're dealing with a vast wealth, if you're dealing with the great things of life, or you're dealing with the despair of life, don't think for a moment you're not on his heart. Thank you, Lord. As Luke continues, especially in this chapter, a beautiful discovery is made in the opening of chapter number one. I wrote this in social media yesterday, and I want to drive this point home again today. This spoke so beautifully to me. The message was written for Theophilus. And 
when you're studying the Bible, it's really easy to pass up names, sometimes because the pronunciation is difficult to say, sometimes because it doesn't seem like their name is insignificant, but Theophilus, his name matters. Theophilus' name means the lover of God, and he was a Roman official who had come to know and trust Jesus, and he needed to be established in the faith. Today, on this call, and for those listening to the replay, I'm speaking to each, each and every one of the lovers of God on this line who desire to be established in your faith. The gospel according to Luke was written to every lover to reveal the heart of the one who's looking forward to spending more time with you. I thought about this earlier when I was talking with one of my brothers in the Lord today, that how awesome it is to realize that we have a lover in Jesus who in many ways sits by the phone, if you will, waiting, waiting for those moments that we reach out, waiting for those moments that we call his name, waiting for those moments where we tell him we need him, waiting for those moments to hear the song of our heart, waiting for those moments to welcome in the cry of our heart. That's the kind of lover we serve. And that's the reason, and that's what is written for each and every one of us in the next 24 chapters is the lovers of God to be established in their faith. And the more you understand the love that comes from this Jesus, the deeper the root will be in your life and you won't walk away from him so easily. One writer says, that Luke wrote his gospel so that his readers might have an accurate and orderly narrative of the life, the ministry, and the message of Jesus Christ. I've said this so many times when we've gathered together, the greatest revelation that you will ever receive is the revelation of Jesus. Not the revelation of who you're called to be, not the revelation of your assignment, not the revelation of what you hope to do in life, but the greatest revelation that you will ever be able to establish your life on is Christ Jesus. And if you don't know him today, I invite you to open your mouth and look up into the sky and ask him to reveal himself to you. And our faithful Jesus will do just that. Luke was known to have carefully, very carefully researched all of his material. The Bible tells us that he was a physician. He interviewed eyewitnesses. He listened to the stories of those who had ministered the word. And in chapter one of Luke, we're invited to look at how God's wonderful news came to, to several people, even in chapter one, and not just how it came to them, but how they responded. One of the first responses that we see in chapter one, and one that many of us can relate to, believe it or not, is unbelief. Why wouldn't unbelief be a common response in the first chapter of Luke's gospel? The truth is, if you look at the time frame in which this story is talking about, the climate was dark. Think about this, fam. The people hadn't heard from God for nearly 400 years. There was no prophetic word given to the people. It was hard for them. Can you imagine going 400 years since you had heard a prophetic word from God? It's hard to wrap our minds around it because we struggle going from Sunday to Sunday. We fight to feel and experience God in our day-to-day -day walk. But the people in this story, 
went 400 years. Another thing that could have sparked unbelief in them is tradition and sometimes corruption ruled the motives of the spiritual leaders at the time. Not to mention that King Herod was a tyrant. He had nine wives and one he executed for no reason at all. Truth is, on the surface, it looked hopeless. No wonder 400 years felt like a long time. One of the first people, if you're looking in the chapter in order that we see in chapter one, is a devoted and obedient priest named Zechariah. I really like Zechariah. His, his very life gives me hope, if I'm being honest. And his very faithfulness to the Lord is just beautiful. When you look at Zechariah, we know that Zechariah, if you look at verses 5 and 7 of Luke, Zechariah was a faithful priest. When you continue on in the story, and I'm just giving highlights till we experience, you know, what the Lord might want to speak to us. Zechariah was a faithful priest. Zechariah was a fearful priest. When you look at 8 through 17, imagine being the first one in 400 years to finally have a divine encounter. Imagine being the one. Was it Malachi, the last one who had gotten a word from the Lord? And now all of the sudden, this priest who is doing his, his duty, this priest that is doing the work that he was called to do, of all the people that God could have chose, God choose, chose to meet with the priest who was old, who thought he was done, Zechariah struggled with his faith. When you look at verses 18 through 22, he struggled with his faith. He was more of a fear guy. 18 through 22, and then we also see this priest who had the favor of the Lord on his life. Isn't that awesome? Another response that stood out to me in this chapter is the response of faith. When you look at Elizabeth's pregnancy, this second birth announcement comes in, and this time it wasn't to Elizabeth and Zechariah, it was to Mary. And Mary responded to that faith, uh, I don't know, maybe astounded, if you will, wouldn't you be? And not only was she astounded, but Mary was surrendered. One of my favorite lines that we read in this chapter that Mary says to the Lord is, be it unto me according to your word. When's the last time the posture of your heart was surrendered? to the point when the Holy Spirit speaks to you instead of giving him the litany of reasons why it couldn't possibly work out, you say, be it unto me according to your word. Another response that we see that spoke to me in this chapter was joy. Now that Mary knew that she was going to be a mom and that Elizabeth was going to be giving birth, they rejoiced together. When you look at, let me see, was it verse 39 maybe? Yeah, Mary visits Elizabeth. They, they have this joy together. Let me see, what's the passage right there? And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. When's the last time you got excited about someone else? Come on, fam. When's the last time you got excited about someone else experiencing the fulfillment of God's promise in their life? 
Maybe that's the real spiritual maturity that God is drawing us to in the coming days. When's the last time you celebrated someone else receiving the thing that you wanted so badly? I sense the Holy Spirit reminding us to celebrate with those who celebrate, to mourn with those who mourn. Elizabeth had joy. She had the joy of her own, own born, unborn son. And then she had joy in Mary and for Mary. And then the fourth response that I see, and then we're going to open this up. The fourth response that I see is praise. Look at verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and all the way through verse 80, Zechariah offers up a praise that would seem can only come from the one who had been there since the beginning of the narrative. And Zechariah blessed the Lord being filled with the Holy Spirit, he prophesied, look at this, he prophesied, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Why wouldn't he praise? He got to be the one to deliver the voice of the Lord that had been silent for 400 years. That speaks so deep to my heart tonight that he was the one. He got to be the one that was going to say, see, God did not forget us. See, God did not leave us or abandon us. And he got to see the fulfillment of that. That's powerful. That's awesome. And that's a reality in your day and in my day. Family, I want to hear from you. What speaks to you in Luke chapter one? Good morning, Minister, uh, Pastor Greg, and then Minister Michael. Um, Pastor Greg is is busy right now, but I'm the one. I'm on his Go phone because my phone is almost dead. So, but the thing that caught my attention was that Zachariah had unbelief and he spoke that unbelief. And in the same situation, Sarah had unbelief and she spoke that unbelief. And what I received, because Mary's perspective changed, it went from how can I, since I'm a virgin, to be it unto me? And the thing that I see about that is that God looks at your heart. We know this, but there can be unbelief there and you're still going to get used by God if you allow him to. Sarah was used, Zachariah was used, and Mary we're all used. And, and so that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing, did you want to speak, Greg? Okay. Greg wants to speak, but to just sum it up, the crux of the matter is that even with unbelief and we, we all deal with that, but it, we tend to think that it makes us unacceptable to God, unused by God. And that's just simply not the truth. Amen. Amen. I was just going to say that uh, I've, I've read this chapter many times before, but the way it was read today mm -hmm. was totally different. It gave me a different view on it. And I started thinking, why is it different today? And I, I thought about the meaning of the name John. So I looked it up. And the meaning of the name John is Jehovah has been gracious. Yeah. Jehovah has graciously given. 
Mm. And what a beautiful story uh, of power and divine holiness that was displayed in this book. So I thought I'd share that. That's beautiful. Thank you. Minister Michael, go ahead, buddy. So this reading tonight continued to highlight for me what God has had, at least for me, as the overarching theme of the reading all day. Um, and that is, I believe that God is calling me and I believe us back to a place of holiness before him. And I do not mean... I do not mean uh, dress in some legalistic way or, or what we wear or what, how we adorn. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our heart posture being one that's set apart, be, being, being one that is obedient regardless, that, that trusts rather than questions. Um, and I just wanted to, to point out here because it says that they were, it says that, that Elizabeth and Zechariah were both righteous before God, walking yeah. blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They had, like, there's a reason why that, that, why that was listed before, like, as the story was being unfolded, because that's a prerequisite, is their, is their relationship. Again, Mary was a virgin, so she was pure before the Lord, and she was chosen. And I just... I hear God calling me saying, Michael, be holy before me. And whenever we skip down to, to Mary's encounter, um, she asked the angel how that was going to be. And it says, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most, most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And just as that was read tonight, my heart was immediately reminded of the scripture that says, they that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where holiness is found. Jesus came. It says right there that he came to restore what was lost. And Jesus, Jesus is that holiness that we're looking for. It is in remaining in him. It is in hiding in the secret place, which he is that secret place that we find that holiness. And when we're there, we're overshadowed. Mm. We're overshadowed by, by the Lord. And Amen. that's where, that's where uh, prophecy happens. Okay. Thanks for sharing, bro. Mama Terry, go ahead. So what I found beautiful is when you when you think of Mary, you see innocence because of the age. And the word of God came comes to her with his prophet, the, well, the angel, right? Um, you know, we, we kind of think of it like, okay, she's pregnant. No, we got to think about what happened at that time. That was a major sacrifice for her to receive this, this command because she was going to be shunned by everyone in her, in, in her group. Because she, the law at that time is that she would be stoned because she wasn't mm -hmm. married. So it's, it's a, the sacrifice that was being called from her. But then I look at Elizabeth. She's at the end of her life. And so she had lived with disappointment. So that was her wilderness time, her desire to have a child and not be able to have a child. But what God is letting us know is that his promises are good. No matter how long it takes for us to receive it, we will receive it in his perfect timing for his purposes. Amen. She ended up giving birth to the messenger that was going to pave the way for Messiah. Yeah. And Mary gave birth to the Messiah. Yeah. So if we are at the end of our spectrum and we think that the Lord doesn't have a purpose for us anymore, well, let's take heed that he still has a purpose. All this requires for us to trust him. And if you are young starting your life now, just know that God has a purpose for your life. And I, that's what I get out of all of this here. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Coach Jay, go ahead, my friend. I guess the first thing that stuck out to me, as soon as you said name, I was like, okay, let me see what these names mean. And so when I looked up Zechariah, that name means Yahweh. So, and it means to be remembered. And I thought how beautiful that God's 
in his in his name in this part is remembering like a, I don't know this little thing just came to me it's like sometimes when things are late it's gonna be great <laughs> so mm. whenever God's do, doing something really big it's always late and we hate when things are late like we get so mad when people are late to a job or late to a meeting but I'm telling like one thing that I've seen in God I've always called myself a late bloomer Everything. I got married late. Everything was late, late, late. But the funny thing about it is we get impatience, but we learn so much more about God mm. when when it's later. He remembers us. And it's like that poem I read in English. It says those um, they savor those who never get like the sweet things in life. When they finally get it, they savor it longer. Mm. And you feel it so much more deeper when you've waited for a really long time for something. Then you mm-hmm. finally get it. And you're like, oh, my God, I've been waiting for this my entire life sometimes. But it's just to me, it speaks of the magnitude of thanks that you give. You give so much more thanks. And wow, wouldn't they give thanks? They were birthing the forerunner. They were birthing, I mean, John, the grace, the message of grace. I think that's, it just brings tears to my eyes. And then the last little thing that got me, I just had to say this part, it's just like, sometimes when we look at um, Mary's situation, we, we do underestimate how hard that was. But what I love is that God, God will use you even despite yourself. You can't even mess up your blessing. Like the, he had to pick lots in order to go into it. And I was like, that's so random. But if God's got something for you, <laughs> come on. If God's got something for you, it's gonna get to you. You can't even mess it up. Like God's will close your mouth. Sometimes mm. I think we think by what we do, that's how God's gonna bless us. But it's just not like that. God will bless you just because he's good. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. he loves you. you. You can't mess up the blessing that God has for you. <laughs> it just blesses me so much. I'm sorry. That's Amen. My Amen. Amen. I really think that there's a message in here also for the Zechariahs and for the Elizabeths. And I see a message here that says, stay faithful, stay faithful. I know you've been doing what you've been doing for a long time. I know that you feel like maybe after 400 years, God's not got anything to say, but both of them remain faithful and righteous before the Lord. And in the Lord's time, he came through. He came through for them. And I just want to encourage you tonight. Don't stop serving. Don't think that this is your time to retire. Don't think this is your time to throw in the towel and give up. Keep serving. He's going to come through for you. Even when you least expect it. Somehow. This wonderful Jesus of ours is going to fulfill his promise and bring it in a surprise you didn't even expect. Isn't that contrast of their ages between Elizabeth and Mary also speak? One was old, one was young. Jesus came for everyone. Not just the old, not just for the established, but also for the young, for every generation, the former and the latter. He came for all of us. I think there's so much hope in that tonight. Pastor Greg, go ahead. Hey, it's interesting that you just said that um, he came for the young and he came from the old and he used them simultaneous simultaneously I can't even say the word to do something so difficult birthing a child is one of the most difficult things on earth to accomplish 
and he's going to use the young to birth his kingdom, his, his, his word, his miracles. He's going to use the old the same. So just because I'm 64 doesn't mean I won't be used. That blessed me so greatly. Wow. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Stephen, go ahead, buddy. And then Mayor Beth. Um, so I love what Coach Jay was saying. Uh, it really touched me. And then his, and what you tied in right there. And so it kind of like what was tugging at me was 13. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayers have been answered or have been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Uh, it reminds me that no matter what we're going through, no matter how long the timing is, because I'm sure Zachariah was praying. It don't say exactly what he prayed for, but we know, obviously, he was praying for a son for all them years and all that time. And it goes to show, you know, God's timing is perfect. It don't matter about your age. You know, if you're praying for something and you've been praying for it for a long time, don't quit praying for it. Keep praying the same. Keep praying. Keep praying into that thing that you're wanting or you're trying to get delivered from from anything. So it just points out to me about prayer as well. Prayer matters. Amen. Prayer is one of our key weapons and we should always try to use it. We're not we should we should should just use it always. So I appreciate you letting Amen. me share. Absolutely. Mary Beth, go ahead, sister. Hey, I was this has been so amazing, but I was drawn to verse fifty. Mm -hmm. Um my version says his mercy extends to those who fear him and um, so I've been just kind of digging it out. Mercy is benevolence or tenderness of heart, treating someone better than they deserve. And so then I looked up that scripture in a couple different versions, and I thought it was so beautiful in the message. It says, his mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. And I thought that was such a beautiful picture of praise there and how God, when we enter into praise, um, his benevolence is over us. Um, his heart is tender towards us. So I just thought that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen to that. Mm. We can't skip over verse number 80, especially if you've been on the morning call at all this week, especially today. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. He was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Don't discount the wilderness experience, fam. The wilderness is a preparation time. I know it seems lonely there. I've lived it. I know it seems like it's never going to end. I've lived it. But what God does in you will make what he does through you more powerful if you'll stick with him in the wilderness. My goodness. Anyone else before we go this, this evening? Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. Matthew, did you have something, bud? Yes, uh, and you'll have to excuse me because I'm driving right now. Um, and okay. I don't have my Bible in front of me. But um, I just think what, what, what I... Um, we talked a lot about uh, not today, but in past in the morning call, we've talked a lot about passing the mantle and things like that and how we have our Elijah's and our Elisha's and we have, right, like our Paul's and our Timothy's and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And we have so many testimonies of men passing the mantle. Um, but this relationship between Elizabeth and Mary, 
Um, on. Not only were they unified under the same mission, right? But also there was some, right? Like Elizabeth had been married, or, or not married, but had been pregnant for six months. It wasn't like they both popped up with the baby at the exact same time. So if there was any space to mentor Mary through uh, an experience that she had never, right? She had never would even anticipate that she would be in the middle of um, the seeing the, the, the way that the body was unified, even as it was presenting the coming Christ, uh, just seems to stand out um, extraordinarily to me. There was a passing of the mantle and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like there was an incredible Stop. amount of experience, um, an incredible amount of experience or an incredible amount of like time dealing with a certain thing before there was an opportunity for mentorship uh, for the, the, the next person who was coming on and furthering the mission. And so I think even wow. when we talk about, you know, um, you know, it, it, it being a work of, of multiple generations and those who are old, right? Like your, your, your old men will see visions and your young men will dream dreams. Well, there's gotta be a point in which like that, that comes together. The two of them come together and communicate, but we always, or at least I always presume that it had to be a thing in which, uh, whomever was the elder was, was, was experiencing the thing for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they could speak to the experience that the young person was going through. And what God is showing me right here in this moment, listen, you could be on that block for six months and then somebody else comes in as long as, I, as, long as God has prepared the heart of the person to come and receive uh, the word of the mission that the Lord has for the both of you or for the body in, in, in general, the God, will, God will use any amount of time um, to, to establish you as an elder or establish one as an elder to then go ahead and forward the mission that he wants the body to unify under. Um, and so that's what I got. That's what I got. And that's beautiful. Wow. Wow. Praise the Lord, bro. It's incredible. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Just some Selah moments. Stay on moments. Pastor Brian and I wrote a course around Mary's song. Magnificat is the name of her song. It's so beautiful. I wish we would have had time to record it. Yeah. Coach Jay, go ahead. I just saw something else. In verse 8, it says when Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order, um, it was like the Lord just spoke to me. While, before he got his blessing, he was in the house of God. You know, he was serving and he was doing what he was supposed to do. Sometimes when we don't get what we want, we can be like little brats. We don't really want to serve. We don't want to be involved. You know, we don't see how God is going to bless us. We, we look at everybody else's, we're comparing, getting the comparison trap. But like, he was just working in his place. He was faithful. And I feel like that's something that we can all take as we are just being faithful to God, serving in the Lord's house and in his temple. God is going to remember us when it's our time. And I feel like sometimes we don't even think that God has a set time for us. I love to read about people who, were blessed when they were young, but also blessed when they were really old. That's been in my spirit. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know, me and my husband, we were reading about, I don't know, I think I can't think of the name. It wasn't Smith Wigglesworth, but it was one of the ministers of like old. He didn't even start his ministry until he was in his 60s. And sometimes we think we have to be spring chickens or, or vice versa. We think we have to be very old. God knows our exact timing. We just need to be faithful to God. We just need to yes. show up. And do his work, cause then at our set time, and I I I feel it sometimes. I'm feeling this that there is this older generation that's been waiting for a while, and their set time is coming. I feel it all week long. I almost said a name last week, cause the name was like started getting really big, and I was like, this person's been waiting, God, and I feel that their set time, Hallelujah, is about to come. Thank you, God. Oh. He remembers us. When we think that our faithfulness is of nothing, God says, no, 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 no. Just hold on. I got your blessing coming. You're, you got a set time. 
And so yeah. I just had to say that. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Sam, what a great, great time together with you tonight. I feel like there's so much more there. And I pray that you come back and listen to the replays and share them when you see them. Pass her on. the things that, yeah. Can I share something? I would love for you to, Doc. <laughs> yeah. I feel like sometimes we read through this. I mean, it's a long, you know, uh, chapter, but I, I feel like sometimes we read past things through so quickly. And out of everything, I'm just thinking, Mary, this young girl who's never been, you know, physically intimate. And on verse 35, where the angel is telling her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will mm. overshadow you. Like, what does that even, what is that experience even like? And the level of trust, really trust comes to my more than faith the level of trust that she must have to have had to really surrender to that just My God. depicts how, how special she is and why God chose her as her favored one. And to think that, you know, Jesus wasn't conceived there. His physical body was conceived then, but he existed before so this is like the point of his transition into this physical world you know yes and i mean we live his in a time, his incarnation right and we yeah. live in such a time that oh, it's just purely evil there's just so much evil and yeah i see the good but there's so many things in subtle ways that you know so many children are attacked from the time of conception, you know, from the time they're in the womb. And just having had recent experiences where, you know, the enemy attacked me in a in a in a way of me sharing information to parents that I realized, yeah. thank you, devil, because now I see what you're after. You're after <laughs> children. And so then yeah. I know that I need to plan strategically to help parents to be informed and to empower them to take back our children because this these things that are happening it's not it's not just we're just quickly moving past things and it's just like reading this this line here there's so much power there that i can't even imagine and grasp what this young girl must have experienced that is not like any other it's not like it, she's physically intimate. It's the spirit coming upon her. Mm -hmm. And I know the moments that we've experienced Holy Spirit, you know, that that cannot be anywhere near of what she experienced. She must have experienced an intense light in her in her womb, you know, to have yeah. to be carrying the word, to be carrying the king. You know, that's going to come and lay his life for our salvation. And so I'll be pondering on that tonight. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Amen. 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 I'm thankful that you are an advocate. Thankful. Father, we love you. We thank you for the revelation of Jesus tonight and all that he has done. God surrendered his throne, came in form of flesh that he could be the one to redeem us. 
from corruption. Lord, every time I think about that, I'm, I'm still overwhelmed by that. I still don't fully have my mind wrapped around the goodness that you've demonstrated so that we would be in right standing with you, have fellowship with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word tonight that has caused us to meditate, consider all of the things that you have desired to say to us. Jesus, continue to grow in us. Continue to be revealed to us and in us. Allow us the grace, Lord, to grow and become the sons and daughters that you have called us to be. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are experiencing that wilderness season of their life. I would give them the grace to become strong in their spirit and not surrender, Lord, to the pressure of the sacrifice or the pain. Father, I pray that you would keep each one of these. Keep them in your heart and near near your heart, Lord, until you are formed in them. I bless you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our community. I trust you. We trust you. In Jesus' name. Hey, friend. Thank you for joining us for another episode of My Daily Bread. We hope today's session helped you to clearly hear the voice of Jesus in your life. If you enjoyed today's gathering, please share this episode with a friend and help us to spread the word about this incredible ministry. To help us continue to reach people around the world with the gospel of Jesus, consider giving today at mydailybread.global. You can also join us live online weekday mornings and Saturdays on Clubhouse. For more information about My Daily Bread global events and resources, visit mydailybread.global.